The following film is based on the book Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, published by Harper and Row. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Richard J. Foster. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, now let me ask you, what is the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? If we expect to get beyond it, we'd better know what it is. I mean, if I want to get beyond St. Louis, I'd better find out where St. Louis is in order to get past it. And we must understand that the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees was no small thing. They sought after God in a way that many of us would probably not be prepared to do. However, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees can be summed up in one word, externalism. It consisted in control over externals, often involving manipulative control of other people. And throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is contrasting the external righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees with the internal righteousness of the kingdom of God. The scribes and the Pharisees said, don't kill. Jesus said, don't hate. The scribes and the Pharisees said, no extramarital sex. Jesus said, no inner lust. The scribes and the Pharisees said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Jesus said, do not return evil for evil. The scribes and the Pharisees said, Give so that all can see. Jesus said, Give so that only God sees. The scribes and the Pharisees said, Pray so that all can hear. Jesus said, Pray so that only God hears. The scribes and the Pharisees said, Fast so that all can see. Jesus said, Fast so that only God sees. The scribes and the Pharisees said, Take care of number one. Jesus said, Learn the care of your Father in heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees said, We change people by judging them, controlling them, manipulating them. Jesus said, We change people by prayer, by asking, seeking, knocking. Now we do not have to look very deeply behind religion in America until we see how saturated it is with the external righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And it is only by the grace of God that we can learn a new way, a way of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In this session, we want to look at the inward disciplines that nurture this internal righteousness of the kingdom of God. Meditation, fasting, study, and prayer. And I would like to look with you briefly at all four disciplines showing how they relate and interrelate, drawing from one another and feeding into each other. And then I want to narrow the field way, way down to the single discipline of prayer and actually only one small aspect of prayer, the work of intercession, or as some have called it, the prayer of faith. Meditation, very simply, is the ability 
to hear God's voice and obey His Word. It's as simple as that. I'm sorry. I wish I could make it more complicated for those of you that like things difficult. You see, it involves no esoteric flights into the cosmic consciousness, no mental gymnastics, no secret mantras or hidden mysteries. Meditation, you see, is so practical, so down to earth. The great God of the universe, the creator of all things, desires our fellowship, desires to be in communication with us. And as a result of that fellowship, that communion, we are enabled to live out the demands of our day with greater perspective and peace. And the wonderful news is that Jesus Christ is alive and here to teach His people Himself. His voice is not hard to hear. His vocabulary is not difficult to understand. He has not contracted laryngitis. And we can hear His voice, and we can obey His word if, if we'll learn to listen. And the wonder of it is that this life of meditation, this life of perpetual communion, this life of hearing and obeying is available to us at all times and in all places. The great Japanese Christian Kagawa wrote, I have found that the door to meditation is open everywhere and any time, at midnight or at noonday, at dawn or at dusk, everywhere, on the street, on the trolley, on the train, in the waiting room, or in the prison cell. I am given a resting place of meditation wherein I can meditate to my heart's content on the Almighty God who abides in my heart. Meditation, you see, cultivates the spirit tenders the heart, sensitizes the conscience. Increasingly, we see all of life from God's perspective. We think His thoughts after Him. We desire only His will. Meditation is the first discipline, the root. The deeper, more sound the root, the fuller, more true the fruit. Our next discipline is fasting, which is the voluntary denial of an otherwise normal function for the sake of intense spiritual activity. Now remember, there is not a thing wrong with these normal functions in life. It is simply that there are times when we set them aside in order to concentrate. Now when we see it from that perspective, we can understand both the reasonableness of fasting as well as the broader dimensions to it. We fast from food, which is the normal, though not the exclusive way Scripture speaks of this subject. But given the contemporary culture, we need to fast from other things as well. We need times when we can learn to fast from people. You see, many of us have a tendency to just devour people, and we usually get severe heartburn from it. <laughs> Now, I suggest that we learn to fast from people not because we are antisocial or because we don't like people, but precisely because we love people intently. And when we are with them, we want to be a help and a blessing to them and not a distraction. And in connection with fasting from people, we need to learn how to fast from the telephone. <laughs> now, the telephone is a wonderful instrument if it does not control us. You know, there are some people who will stop praying to answer the telephone. Can you think of anything more absurd than that? You married couples know what I mean. There are people who will stop making love to answer the telephone. I want you to know something. I will not. <laughs> we had a dear pastor friend in our home some time ago and we had a meal together and when we finished eating we were sharing together and while we were sharing the telephone rang and because what we were talking about was significant I said to him let it ring if it's important they'll call back and he looked at me 
and he looked at that telephone, and he looked back at me, and he said, I have never done this in my entire life. <laughs> and then this actually happened. I'm not making it up. He looked right at the telephone, and he went, <laughs> now, in our home, when we're having a meal together, or when I'm reading stories to the boys, we do not answer the telephone. And the reason is simple. I want those boys to know that they are more important than anything that can be on that machine. Now, I know you can't believe this, but people have lived without the telephone for hundreds of years. <laughs> Look, you just let it ring sometime, you know, just as an experiment, and monitor your own feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? I'll miss the chance of a lifetime. Just remember, if it's important, they'll call back. And then let's have times when we learn to fast from the media. It is amazing to me that many people seem to be incapable or at least unwilling to go through an entire day concentrating on a single thing. Our sense of concentration is constantly broken up with this demand and that. Newspapers, radio, television, magazine, everything interrupts our sense of concentration. No wonder we feel fractured and fragmented. Some of you right here are so enslaved to television that if it were taken away from you, you would go through withdrawal. I mean, it's amazing to me. We now have radios that we can strap to our wrists like a watch or put over our ears like mufflers so that we will never find ourselves where horror of horrors were without noise. And also, let's learn to fast from billboards. Hmm? <laughs> I still remember the day that I was driving the Los Angeles freeway system when all of a sudden I realized that for one solid hour my mind had been dominated by the billboards. I mean, when you think of it, the notion that Pepsi's the real thing or that Coke adds life is pornography of the first magnitude. That is, it is a complete distortion of what is actually the case. Now, when I suggest that we learn to fast from billboards, I do not mean that we refrain from looking at billboards, but that the billboard be a signal to us of another reality. When the ad man shouts out to us his four-letter obscenities, more, 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 maybe that can trigger into our minds another four-letter word, a rich, full-bodied word, less less, less. When we are bombarded with bigger-than-life pictures of foxy ladies and well-fed babies, maybe that can trigger into our minds another world, a world in which 460 million people are the victims of acute hunger. 10,000 of them will be dead before we go to sleep tonight. A world in which a million hogs in Indiana have superior housing to a billion people on this planet. And then that leads me to suggest that we also discover times when we will fast from our gluttonous consumer culture that we find so comfortable. For our soul's sake, we need times when we can be among Christ's favorites, the bruised, the broken, the dispossessed, not to preach to them, but to learn from them. Like Kagawa, we need to go in Franciscan-like poverty into the slums of our cities to hear the whimpering, moaning songs from the slums. We need to force ourselves to look around and see the small, bony, naked child lying listless on the small cot. He will soon die, the victim of malnutrition. And like me, you want to shut your eyes and forget that world. But we need to stay there and really see this little boy. He is a two-year-old whose brain is already vegetating from moroseness, a severe form of malnutrition. Maria, the mother,
tries to speak to us, but words do not come. Tears don't even come. I say that for the sake of our balance, for the sake of our sanity, we need times when we can be among those who, in the words of Mahatma Gandhi, live an eternal compulsory fast. Fasting reveals what controls us. We cover up with food, people, and the media what is inside of us. But in times of fasting, these things come to the surface. Our pride, our fear, our anger, our obsession with the good life. And this is wonderful news to the children of the kingdom because now, now, these demons of the spirit are unmasked for what they truly are and so can be healed one by one. And then there's study. Study is that spiritual discipline in which the mind takes on an order conforming to the order of what it concentrates upon. You see, to think rightly about God is, in an important sense, to have everything right. To think wrongly about God is, in an important sense, to have everything wrong. Jesus made it unmistakably clear that it is the knowledge of the truth that will set us free. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You see, good feelings will not free us. Ecstatic experiences will not free us. Getting high on Jesus will not free us. Without a knowledge of the truth, we will not be free. And that truth can be found in the first and foremost book which we study, the Bible. The psalmist asked, how can a young man keep his way pure? How can he? And then he answered his own question, by guarding it according to thy word. And then he added, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And Christians throughout the centuries have found that the study of Scripture has this wonderful effect of keeping us free from sin. Paul declared, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. Note that according to Paul, the central purpose of the work of Scripture is inner transformation. You see, we come to the Scripture to be changed, not to amass information. So read the Scriptures, memorize the Scriptures, allow them to dwell richly in your heart. It was said of George Fox that if the Bible were destroyed, it would be found in his mouth. It should be that way with us as well. In addition to the studying of the Bible, don't neglect the study of some of the great experiential classics of Christian literature. Begin with the Confessions of St. Augustine and, and, and then go to the Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. Don't neglect the Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. For added pleasure, read the delightful Little Flowers of St. Francis. Enjoy the Table Talks of Martin Luther. Consider reading The Pacemaker of Religious Journal Writing the Journal of George Fox, or perhaps the better-known Journal of John Wesley. From the 20th century, read A Testament of Devotion by Thomas Kelly, The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Nor should we forget the great body of literature by men and women from other disciplines. Many of these thinkers have unusual perception into the human predicament. Writers like Shakespeare and Milton, Cervantes and Dante, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, and in our century, Dog Homershaw. Don't be overwhelmed or discouraged by the books that you haven't read. The key is not how much we read, but to what extent our lives are changed by what we do read. Allow what you do read to change you and draw you closer into the heart of God. If you read William Law's A Serious Call to a Devout and a Holy Life, be sure that the focus of your study is not a book, but the devout 
and holy life. But I haven't even yet spoken about the nonverbal books from which we learn. Think of the book of nature, learning to get in touch with God's wonderful creation, allowing God to speak to us through land and sky and sea and all the little creatures that creep upon the earth. They're the messengers of God, you know. Dostoevsky said, love all God's creation, the whole and every grain of sand in it. Love every leaf, every ray of God's light. Love the animals, love the plants, love everything. If you love everything, you will perceive the divine mystery in things. Once you perceive it, you will begin to comprehend it better every day. And there are many other nonverbal books we study besides nature. There's the book of life, as we observe the relationships that go on between human beings. For example, just to watch how much of our speech is aimed at justifying our actions. Many of us, you know, just foam at the mouth constantly. Because we're in this constant process of adjusting our public image. You see, if I've done some wrong thing, or even some good thing, that I think you might misunderstand, and I find out that you know about it, I'm going to be very tempted to speak up and straighten you out on that matter and make sure that you understand that I'm okay. Look, let's just face it. I'm not okay. And you're not okay. But that's okay. <laughs> because we live under grace, don't we? But you see, we study this in ourselves and in other people, and as we do, we learn. We grow in the knowledge of God. We come to understand how He works with His children and in what ways we need to be set free. We have, we have docile hearts, teachable spirits, and we find that Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is our ever-present teacher. Never forget the mind will always take on an order conforming to the order of whatever it concentrates upon. And that's why it's so vitally important to give our minds to those things that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and gracious. You can see why study is so important to the work of prayer. Study gets our heads screwed on straight about God. And only when we truly understand the character of God, His goodness and His love, that at His heart is the desire to give and to forgive, can we know how to pray. And prayer helps study by implanting a teachable spirit to receive the truth of God. Without prayer, knowledge will puff up. With prayer, knowledge can grow into wisdom, which will bless everyone. Well, having given this brief summary, let me turn our attention to the spiritual discipline of prayer itself, that life of perpetual communion with God, which is at the heart of the inner life which Jesus stressed. Oh, there are so many, many things that we could look at, but we want to narrow the field way down. And so I want to share with you about learning to pray for others. The prayer of intercession. I think, I'm thinking of those times when we are particularly concerned to take up particular individuals or situations or circumstances and to intercede before God on behalf of those individuals or situations or circumstances. And I have a special reason for wanting to take up this particular aspect of prayer. Folks, people desperately need the kind of help that we can give them. Marriages are being shattered. Children are being destroyed. People are living in misery. And we can help them if we will learn to pray. You see, mature prayer takes us beyond ourselves to care for others. 
And if we genuinely care for others, we will desire for them far more than it is within our power to give them. And that will lead us to prayer. And I'd like to share with you in this session as simply as I know, but in a way I hope that will be helpful to you, a few things that I have learned in attempting to pray the prayer of intercession. My first suggestion is that we learn to listen. To listen. Soyen Kierkegaard said, a man prayed, and at first he thought that prayer was talking. But he became more and more quiet until in the end he realized that prayer was listening. Listening. You see, as we learn to listen, we understand that the key to prayer is to get a hold of God, not the answer. We learn to value God more than the answer. And amazingly, it is this very process which cultivates our lives in such a way that we can genuinely receive God's answer. Juliana of Norwich put it this way in her lovely book, Showings, God speaking to her, I am the ground of thy beseeching. First, it is my will that thou shalt have it. After I make thee to will it, and after I make thee to beseech it, and thou beseechest it, how should it then be that thou shouldest not have thy beseeching? Now that went right by you, didn't it? <laughs> you know how I know? <laughs> I had to read that 12 times before I ever understood it. Foster translation. God speaking to you. I'm the one that wants you to have it in the first place. First, I plant the idea in your heart and mind, and then I give you the desire for it. And then I give you the ability or the power to ask. And you ask, well then, how is it possible that you would not receive what you are asking? You see, when we see it from that perspective, prayer is like a, like a reflex action to God's prior initiation upon the heart. Now the key idea in listening to God is to sufficiently quiet our egocentric drives so that we can let go of our agendas and be able to hear God's agenda. By listening, we get in tune with God's heartbeat. We begin to think His thoughts after Him. Now obviously, I'm referring to an all-pervasive mode of listening as well as specific times of listening. But now, let me give you a little word of caution as you are listening. I think it is helpful, especially in the beginning, to start small. You see, there is a progression in the spiritual life. You do not take an occasional jogger and put them into a marathon race. And you don't do that in the spiritual life either. You know how we do it? <laughs> we get our Bibles and we read. The disciples were in the upper room for 10 days and then the Holy Spirit fell. We say, quick, quick, everybody in the church, lock the doors. We're going to pray for 10 days. <laughs> now after about a half an hour of that, I mean, it is such a disaster of an experience that we never want to pray again. <laughs> you know how I know, don't you? <laughs> Let me tell you how I first really understood the importance of this principle of progression. Oh, I was so serious in those early days. You wouldn't have liked me a bit. <laughs> I decided at one time that I was going to fast and pray for three days. <laughs> And so I did. And uh, I was concerned to take up particularly two individuals in our fellowship. Now, these were physical matters. That just happened to be the way it was with me. One was a dear older woman that was terribly crippled up with arthritis. And I wanted to pray that she might be well. 
The other was a young man in the hospital dying of cancer. Now, God did many wonderful things for me in that three-day experience that I won't go into tonight. But the woman, crippled with arthritis, continued to be crippled with arthritis until I heard just recently that God's friends, the doctors, were able to come up with a new kind of operation that gave her some a substantial relief, and I'm delighted. The man who was dying of cancer died. Now, I know I could have spiritualized, you know, I, I all meant it spiritually, and, and we did pray for them spiritually, and good things happened. But I was really hoping that they might get well. And it didn't work. It didn't work. But by that time, I had learned that it is helpful to listen. And so I said, Lord, I'd so appreciate it if you would teach me anything from this experience. I'm willing to learn. Now, it doesn't always have to be that way. There are many things that I suppose I'm going to need to wait to heaven to find out the answer. But I said, Lord, I'm willing to learn. And so I'll try to live in a mode of listening. Well, a few days after that, I was in the home of a very dear friend, philosophy professor at the University of Southern California, great man of God. We've been in many prayer projects together. And he was inviting me to go to a large church to hear a little old lady speak on prayer. Well, I wasn't sure about this, and I was hemming and hawing and trying to think of a way to get out of it. And my friend just nailed me to the wall. He said, Foster, the only difference between you and me and this woman is that when she prays, things happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go. And I went. Big church. <laughs> I hid up on the balcony. And here was this little old lady. Nothing impressive about her. I didn't think she could even speak particularly well. I thought, I know more about homiletics than she does. She is going to teach me. And she was talking along, and, and this is kind of the way she talks. She, she said, now, when you are first beginning to pray, do not start with the most difficult cases, like cancer and arthritis. <laughs> She said, begin more simply. Take up uh, things you'd normally never think of praying about, you know, headaches and earaches and colds and things like that. Aha, you see, a light went on. Of course, of course. And so I begin to take up very, very simple things, things I'd almost be embarrassed to tell you about. But slowly, 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 I begin to see how God works and how I can grow in my faith. There was a 10-year-old in a teaching session very similar to this. Oh, little children get it very quickly. And he decided on a prayer project. And do you know what it was? <laughs> he wanted to pray for dogs. <laughs> and do you want to know why? He had a paper out. <laughs> 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 and you know, these dogs would come out barking and growling and snarling, especially one big German shepherd. And he wanted to pray that the peace of Christ would come into these dogs. <laughs> and the next day, he was out on his bicycle, and out came this German shepherd, barking and growling and snarling. And I don't know where he got the idea, but I think it's delightful. He spoke to the dog. He said, God loves you, and God loves me, and I love you, and I hope you'll love me real soon. <laughs> and do you know, that dog stopped barking, wagged its tail, and they became great friends. <laughs> Have you ever prayed for dogs? <laughs> it's great fun. Doesn't always work, <laughs> but lots of fun. <laughs> well, my first suggestion is then that we listen. And as we listen, we are receptive, open to the small things of life, the insignificant, the trivial. They may be the voice of the Lord. My second suggestion, and it is so simple that I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, but I have found that I must. It is that we ask, that we ask. You do not have because you do not ask, said James. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly 
to spend it on your passions. That is, you didn't learn to listen. But as we listen, as we learn to think his thoughts after him, as we come into a sense of assurance that this is what would please him, then we ask a clear, definite, straightforward declaration of what is to be. If you do not know it is God's will, don't ask it. That's the prayer for guidance, which should saturate everything that we do. Now look, I know that we will get it wrong sometimes. God seldom writes His will across the sky. We may miss a leading sometimes. In fact, the only person who has never missed a leading is a person who's never, who's never followed one. But there is something worse than getting it wrong, and what's worse is not trying. So you see, we step out into the deeper waters and try with humbleness of heart. And I have found that God often takes our stumbling, misguided efforts and uses them for His glory. Now sometimes people want to know how often we should ask. Now I know that there are those who teach, pray once. Anything more than that shows a lack of faith. Well now, I want to be as kind as I possibly can to that type of teaching, but very frankly, it flies in the face of a great deal of biblical material, particularly Jesus' parables of importunity. There is a need to keep at it. Now, if it is an emergency, obviously we set everything aside and concentrate. But many of the situations that you and I will be taking up are not of that order. And so my suggestion is this, that at least once a day, more if it comes to you, but once a day we take ten minutes or so, center ourselves before God, listen to Him, be open to His prompting, any adjusting of our praying and concern, and then as we're centered, as we're hearing, then we call into being what is to be. We ask. My third suggestion is that we believe it with both the conscious and the subconscious mind. Now here is my problem. I would be praying long, I go, Oh Lord, I believe, I believe, I believe. And there'd be this little thing inside me, you know, you liar, you liar, you liar. <laughs> I mean, I would believe it, but, but I couldn't believe it. That is, I would believe it with the conscious mind. Because you can control the conscious mind with the will. But I couldn't believe it with the subconscious mind. And every time I tried to force the subconscious to come along, it would rebel, and so there'd be kind of a conflict within me. And then I found something stronger than the will. You know what it is? The imagination. I learned that if I could just be given a picture of what could be, it was for me the first step to really believing that it could be so. Now, I was good with the imagination as a child, but I'd been trained against it all of my academic life, and, and so it was very, very hard. But I, have, I had friends that helped me. Reading the Gospels and seeing how Jesus taught people helped me. The great psychiatrist Carl Jung helped me. Children helped me. The great devotional masters helped me because they made constant appeal to the imagination. George Bernard Shaw, in his play, Joan of Arc, has Joan saying, God speaks to me. And her enemies reply, oh, that's just your imagination. And she says, I know. That's how God speaks to me. Mm -hmm. And many times, when I'm praying with someone, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm given a little picture of their brokenness. And so I'll try to create a little picture of their wholeness. What would please God? What would conform to His way? And then I'll just pray that into the person. And, and very often there'll be a deep inner sigh, or perhaps they'll begin to weep. And when we finish, they'll turn and, and, and they'll say, How did you know? I didn't know. I just saw it. 
That's the idea. So for me, there became an intimate connection between imagining, between conceiving and believing. If I could imagine it, I could believe it. I have a friend who is a teacher of emotionally disturbed children. The kind of situation where uh, some of the children would crawl up in a fetal position underneath their desk. Or when they'd go out to recess, one little girl would jump up on the fence and hold on so tightly that, that they would hurt her hands to take her off. So they just had to leave her there and uh, go back into the classroom. And about a half an hour later, here she'd come tripping in. Well, this man decided that those children would become his prayer project. And uh, so when they would crawl up in a fetal position, he'd reach down and pick them up. This was his way of the laying on of hands. And he would be praying for them. Now, he never told them that he was praying for them. That would be unkind. He just did it. And he would go around teaching the other children. Pretty soon they would relax. And he'd set them down and put them back at their desk. And here's how he got the children to participate in the prayer project. I thought it was a delightful idea. He'd call them aside and, and he'd say, have you ever played baseball? Oh, yeah, it's great. Have you ever hit a home run? Well, no, but I'd like to. <laughs> all right, then he'd say, here's what I want you to do in all of life, whether you're at home or school or whatever it is, I want you in your imagination to picture yourself hitting a home run and you're coming around third and all your friends are running out there and slapping you on the back. And that's the way it's going to be for you. Do you know, by the end of that school year, 23 of the 25 children were able to go back to the regular classroom. Isn't that wonderful? You can do that. I can do that. I have another friend who is a lawyer. He works mainly with divorce cases. He's also a Christian. And he decided that his clients would become his prayer projects. And when they would come in ready for a divorce and he's filling out the papers, he would pray for them inwardly. And here's how he did it. He would imagine Jesus standing behind the couple, pouring little ideas into their heads, like he'd have the Lord standing behind the man, putting little ideas into his head, like, uh, you know, uh, my, she looks nice today. I kind of like the way she combs her hair. I wonder what I ever saw in that other woman anyway. You know, things like that. And then the same thing for the woman. And then he would imagine this huge brick wall between the two of them. Now this was not hard for him to imagine. <laughs> and he would invite the Lord Jesus Christ to go and take that wall down brick by brick. And of course, He's getting material to pray about as he's visiting with them. A little hostility here, a little anger there, until it's all gone. And then he would construct a house built out of compassion and forgiveness and kindness and consideration. And he would picture the two of them seated in the living room, holding hands with the television off. Do you know, he lost a good number of divorce cases that way. Not always, because these things are very difficult, but sometimes. Do you see, he, he imagined, he conceived it, and so he could believe it. And so, we listen, we ask, we believe. My fourth suggestion is that we give thanks for what is to be. It's the gracious thing to do, you know. Now, I know that there are people who, who will pray, thank you, Lord, that it's happened, <laughs> or something like that. Now, that's fine, and I'm glad if they can pray that way, but I've never quite been able to pray that way, and the reason simple. I know that it hasn't happened. 
I mean, there's the person, there's the couple, there's the situation, and I can't make myself believe that something has happened that hasn't happened. But I can believe that it can be, that it will be. What am I doing? Just trying to look ahead a little bit, maybe a few days or weeks or months or years, doesn't matter, and to focus my attention on what can be, what will be, rather than what is. And so then to say, thank you, Lord Jesus, that what we have seen or the words that we have spoken is the way it's going to be. Amen. Now please, don't you dare say amen unless you mean amen. That's a very strong word. So be it. That's the way it's going to be. Well, we listen. We ask. We believe. We give thanks. In this session, we've looked at those spiritual disciplines that nurture the internal righteousness of the kingdom of God. Meditation, the ability to hear God's voice and obey His word. Fasting, the voluntary denial of an otherwise normal function for the sake of intense spiritual activity. Study, the experience through which the mind takes on an order conforming to the order of whatever it concentrates upon. And prayer, the experience of perpetual communion. Jan, you know that lovely little worship chorus, Father, I Adore You. Would you help us close this session with that song? Oh.